Hey, what's up, pest control community? This is Dan Plata, CEO of Blue Skies Services, coming at you today with a target budget spreadsheet. So this spreadsheet is designed after doing bookkeeping for a bunch of home service companies, pest control included, but window cleaning, pressure washing, janitorial, home cleaning, all of the above. Um, our books lay out much the same, but this is specifically designed and the targets are put in for a pest control company. Today in this video, I'm gonna walk through how to use the main tab of that spreadsheet so that you can go through. And the, the cool thing is, it's pretty much already built for you to the extent that the only thing you literally need to do is put in your sales by month that you expect or wanna shoot for, and it's gonna build the rest of the budget for you. However, you can get way more detail than that if you want to. You can override the percentages that I have put in there with your own. You can also override them with dollar amounts. And there's also tabs to input your sales and marketing plan and see what that spits out for sales for the year and builds your budget off of that. There's a tab for payroll where you can really nerd out on how you pay your technicians, how you pay your admin people, both commission and hourly and like all the different ways to pay them. And it literally builds it all out for you. There's even a tab for assets and liabilities that impact the balance sheet and whether they get capitalized or not and how much you depreciate and how much the payments are principal and interest. And so you can get really nerdy but you don't have to. So if you just heard all that and you're like, holy smokes, Dan, that's a whole nother level. I don't wanna get into that. Don't worry, you don't have to. You can just take it and run with it, literally just putting in your sales per month. So I'm gonna go kind of top to bottom through this spreadsheet, explain how it works, explain how to do some of the overrides, explain how we got to some of these numbers and what you're shooting for in the pest control industry. And then if you want to nerd out on those other tabs and like really take this thing to the max, there's other videos for you. And if you downloaded this one, you should be able to go, uh, if you downloaded the spreadsheet and that's how you got this video, kind of stick to that same place and you'll be able to see all the other videos out there. If you're watching this and you haven't gotten that spreadsheet yet, go to yourblueskies.com and go grab it. There's a tab on there for target budgets. You'll see it grab the pest control one. So let me do a little screen share and uh, let's walk through this baby. So um, just a couple like high level things I wanna point out right from the get goes. So one thing that uh, in the service industry we always need to pay attention to is how many days are actually in the month. So this year, 2021 coming up, there's 20 days in February, weekdays to get work done. March has 23 days. So whether you're working weekends or not, you know, you may need to edit that, but I just think it's astounding how it's so easy to overlook the fact that in March, you should expect a 15% increase without doing anything differently. You literally just have 15% more days to earn revenue. So in your sales targets right now, I don't have that built in. I don't have a 15% increase in March, but just something to think about as you forecast those sales, be mindful of how many days you have in that month to actually go produce revenue. The other thing is, depending on how many times you pay people in a month or how your payroll is set up, uh, so right now we have this built out for weekly payroll, but depending on how you have it set up, you're going to have months where you have one extra payroll land. If you're paying weekly, you're paying four times a week most or four times per month in most months, but as you can see here, April is probably going to have five payrolls for you, July's got five, September got five, and December's got five. I, if you're bi-weekly, I want to say it's like July and December both have three instead of two. And that creates a massive swing in your expenses in that month just due to the timing of when those payrolls land. And the cool thing is I've already built that math in here for you. So you can see your payroll is consistent Jan, Feb, March based on $45,000 in sales. And then boom, your payroll jacks up in April. That's because you have another one that landed. Um, and it's all weighted so that it balances out over the course of the year. So that's the first thing to take into account. Now, where you come into play. First thing you want to do, even if you're going to like nerd out on all these other tabs, which go check out the other videos for that. I'll kind of show you how they work on this video, but I'm not going to like dive into them too much. Um, first thing you want to do is just lay out your sales forecast for next year. So type in per month in this blue row here, how much you're going to do. Don't mess with the gray row. Anything that's gray is a formula in here, so just leave it alone. The blue stuff you can mess with, the dark blues here. So change your sales forecast to whatever you want it to be. I'm gonna say we're doing 45,000 a month, 540,000 540, for the year. 
just to have something in there to work with. And you can see like the whole, the whole sheet is reading off of that. So if I zeroed out February, it changes what's in the gray cell here and all the expenses go away because we don't have any revenue coming in. Um, and the reason why sales duplicate is because if you use the sales and marketing tab, it's gonna kind of override your manual entry, your manually entry, you know what I meant. It's gonna override what you manually entered here and it's gonna pull in what's on the sales and marketing tab. Um, let me just show you what that looks like. So I've got some hodgepodge already created in here just for grins. Um, and there's this little button uh, at the top to say use. And if we use it, then it's gonna override what's in there with a forecast of sales based on our sales and marketing spend. And then all the expenses are gonna adjust accordingly. So the cool thing about these extra tabs is you can like mess with them and maybe you like it, maybe you don't. If you don't want the master sheet to use it, just take that off and it goes back to your manually and manual entries. Um, as you go, you're gonna punch in the actuals that you achieve against your budget. So right from the get go, January's done. You've got two different sales numbers to punch in. One is cash sales and one is accrual sales. And when I say cash sales, I don't mean like, hey, Mrs. Jones, thanks for your money. This is a cash job. I'm gonna put this cash in my pocket. Not those kinds of cash sales. Um, those aren't gonna be in your books at all if you're doing those and so be it. Um, what I mean by cash sales is from an IRS perspective, that is, that is based on when the money hits your bank account. And if you're doing under 5 million a year, you're probably taxed based on cash sale, cash sales, not accrual sales. So cash sales are when the money actually hits your bank account, that should be what you have in QuickBooks. That's when the deposit comes in and you say sales. Now accrual sales are when you actually invoice the work. And ideally, you know, your cash and accrual sales are as close together as possible. You invoice the work and Mrs. Jones gives you the money for the job that you just did. However, if you have a time lag between when you actually get paid and when you invoice the work, um, it creates a difference between your cash and accrual sales. And what we find is that all of these expenses that we're going to go through are really driven off of your accrual sales. You do the work, you invoice it, and those expenses are incurred whether Mrs. Jones pays you now or two months later. So cash sales are important. It kind of shows your, um, your cash cycle, if you will, how long it takes you to collect. And it's important for tax purposes because that's the revenue you're going to get taxed on. But accrual sales are a much better predictor of expenses and are a better um, barometer for how you are performing operationally how well you're managing your expenses. So it's important to put both in here. What we're really forecasting here is accrual based sales. We're forecasting when we're gonna do the work, not necessarily when Mrs. Jones is gonna pay us. I don't know why I keep using Mrs. Jones. I blame Sean Day. Sean, if you ever watch this video, he always talks about the Jones family. So I guess I'm hooked. All right, so now we got all these expenses and I got 20 minutes to finish this video before my next meeting. So let's crank it out. Um, so cost of goods sold in our business model in the service industry is going to be anything that's happening in the field. So whether it's the labor, the supplies, the merchant processing fees to get paid because yeah, we do like to get paid when we go out to do work and we get paid every time we do a job. So even that would be a uh, cost of goods sold. It ha it's predictable. It happens every time we go to do a job and it's out in the field, it's cost of goods sold. So the first one, wages, and I'm gonna say these are wages uh, all inclusive of training costs and payroll taxes. So it should be around 30% in the pest control industry um, on average throughout the year. If you've got some seasonality or something like that, you may have some high points and some low points, but you should be shooting for around 30% fully loaded wages uh, for technicians. Now you've got a half a percent for equipping them with a company shirt and maybe some steel toe boots or a hat or something cool. Um, you got your uniforms and apparel and safety gear and stuff that's like actually going on them. Half a percent should be more than enough to equip the folks in the field. You got some workers cap insurance to keep them safe. Damages and repairs. Like we hate that it happens, but your employees are going to break something out there or they're going to damage the customer's property some way, somehow. It's not going to be pretty. And it's probably actually not going to flow evenly across the year, but you're not going to be able to predict when it happens either. But if you're doing 540,000 a year, you're probably gonna spend a few grand uh, fixing stuff for your clients that you damaged when you were there. Um, so a half a percent is a good level to budget just to make sure you have money set aside 
for just when, you know, shit happens, right? Um, so you're driving around decent sized rigs with some chemicals and reels and hoses and this sort of thing and that sort of thing. You probably got around 4% in fuel. You got a couple percent in merchant processing fees for getting paid from Mrs. Jones. Um, and then you got supplies and chemicals and then you've got tools and equipment. So, so supplies and chemicals would be the stuff that you're using up at the job site. In pest control, it's gonna be mostly chemicals, right? Um, for tools and equipment, those are gonna be things that stay on the truck or are part of the truck and you use them over and over and over and over and over again from job to job to job to job. So in general, in the pest control space, we're using a little bit more percentage in supplies and chemicals, a little less in tools and equipment. Your tools and equipment might be a lot higher if you're scaling rapidly and like setting up a bunch of trucks. Um, so you may want to adjust that if you're scaling rapidly. Um, otherwise, in this case, you're just kind of replacing parts, if you will. Um, but in general, you add it all up and your cost of goods sold should be around 45%. Now, let me show you um, how these overrides work real quick here. And I'll just do it in this section and just know that it works the same in the rest of these sections. Let's say you already know your labor percentages and you're like, Dan, I know I can beat 30 because the last couple of years we've been in the high 20s, um, you know, fully loaded with payroll taxes and everything. So I'm actually at like 28%. You just put your percentage in the percent override column here and it's gonna ripple through the entire year. So notice if I take that out, it reverts back to what it was, but let's say we went 28%. Um, let's say workers comp, you're like, oh yeah, I'm actually at like two and a half percent. Um, I'm gonna add a decimal in there just to, uh, oh, I'm gonna center this thing cause I'm OCD like that. Um, but I wanna see my half percent. So let's say I'm not at two, I'm at two and a half. I had a injury a year or two ago and so my rate's a little high. Um, and if you had some seasonality in here now, remember like your workers comp would be going like this because it's based off of percentage. You might say, actually, I know that I pay the same amount every month and it's really like 1,050 bucks, not this 1125. If you override the dollar amount now, that's gonna like supersede everything, if you will. So the overrides kind of go right to left. The, the rightmost one here will override this percentage override, which will override this industry target. Now, the last override would be from one of these tabs. If you use one of these tabs and you select that use option, it's gonna override everything that's in here and pull in those dollars and percentages from those tabs. Um, so that's how the different overrides work. But like I said at the get-go, this thing is like pre-built that you don't even need to touch it, but you may want to look through it, customize it for your business, kind of think through your expenses that would land in that bucket. Are you high, are you low? Is it the same dollar amount every month? and then tweak it as you go. Um, tweak it in these overrides so that you're actually forecasting and predicting specifically for your business. So those are your costs of goods sold. We're looking at around 45%, which is pretty cool. Um, I don't know why that's cool. That just seemed like the right thing to say. What is actually really cool or pretty cool, maybe it's really cool, I'll let you be the judge, is um, once you start putting actuals in here, it's gonna show you your percent of spend against your accrual revenue, like how much, what percent are you spending on that line item? And then it's gonna show you your variance against what you budgeted for that line item. And if you're better than that uh, percent that you budgeted for, let's say supplies were at 5%, you're actually at like 4%, it's gonna color it green. If you're on the high side, it's gonna color it yellow. And it's gonna total it all up to this line item at the top. And that's going to stop light. Um, it's going to be red, yellow, or green. Red is if you're missing it and you're, and you're off more than two and a half percent. Yellow would be you're missing it, but you're within a couple percent. So you're kind of on the warning track, like you're close. And green would be you're beating the budget for that overall category. So this is cost of goods sold. All right. So we got 45% cost of goods sold. We're scrolling down. We enter our actuals. Now we've got our budgeted gross profit in here. Gross profit or gross margin is how much money you get to keep right after you do a job. So immediately you do a job in pest control and about 45% of that money is gone before you get back to the shop. It's already spent. It's spent on the wages, it's spent on the tools, it's spent on the merchant processing fees for running Mrs. Jones' credit card. So you've got 55% gross profit margin, about 300,000 in profit margin here. Um, gross profit as, as we scroll through. But now you have four other groups of expenses. 
And we break this into four other groups because how you make decisions in these groups is strategically different. Super important that you don't just lump all of them together or you're gonna lose a lot of clarity on your business and you're gonna know something's broken and you're gonna have no idea what it is. So if you feel like you have an expense problem and you produce a lot of revenue but you have no money left, it might be because you're not measuring these things in these buckets and so you can't identify where your problem is. So we break it into four different buckets to help us identify if we have any expenditure problems and to know where we have room to invest more and grow more. So speaking of which, like the number one place to invest money in your business is not in tools and equipment. Um, it's not in an in office, it's in marketing, right? The only thing that really generates a return in our business is the marketing and then the person that we send out to do the work. The equipment is only as good as the guy that's running it. Um, that doesn't generate a return for us. We have to have the work booked before we even can put it to use, right? The office we're in, our customers don't come to our office. They don't care what it looks like. Our employees might care a little bit, but it doesn't generate a return for us. Marketing, 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 marketing is the only thing that generates a return for your business. It is the stock market of your business. So we're budgeting for around 10% uh, expenditures. I'm not even calling them expenditures. They're not expenses, they're investments. We're investing 10% of our revenue back into marketing. Um, you might give some to charity. We're gonna put that into marketing. You're gonna have some marketing infrastructure like software and website stuff. You might use Responsibid to make it easy for clients to find you and buy from you. And so stuff like that that's behind the scenes but making it easy for customers to interact with you and buy from you. We're gonna call that marketing infrastructure, marketing software and website expenses. Then you've got your ad expenses for the Googles, the Facebooks, the home advisors, wherever you're spending that ad money, maybe some radio or something like that. And then you have your labor and contract, which would be anybody you're paying to run those ads or lend their expertise. Expertise. Maybe you have a social media person that you're paying to do your social media. Maybe you have a person you're paying to run your Google ads. You might have a person that you're paying to do your SEO or something like that. We're gonna put them in a separate line item here so we can break apart those different pieces of our marketing game. And we wanna spend around 10%. Now, marketing's kind of a goofy one because if you're spending less than that, yeah, you're conserving some cash, but you're handcuffing your growth, right? If you're spending more than that, you might not make any money this year, but you're really setting yourself up well to make a hell of a lot of money in future years. So marketing's kind of one of those things where the budget is really as much as you can afford to spend to grow your business in the future, money that you don't necessarily need now. Um, so 10% is a good average level for a scaling, growing business. And then of course you got your spot to enter the actuals here. Um, admin would be the next bucket. So if marketing is the cost to get the leads in the door, admin is the cost to convert those leads and to like just keep track of all the stuff, right? So uh, your bigger expense in admin is gonna be whoever's in the office answering the phones, running your payroll, doing the stuff to keep the lights on behind the scenes. So admin is mostly wages for people in the office, not people out in the field, people in the office, maybe your salespeople, if you have salespeople doing door-to-door -door stuff, they would fall into admin too. Um, so you've got a few other expenses in here. You're probably running payroll, paying employees. So you've got Gusto or Sure Payroll or QuickBooks or whatever you use for payroll and there's some fees for that. Um, you've got accounting services for a badass bookkeeper like me to keep track of everything and then you're paying a CPA at the end of the year to run the taxes. Um, I put a little bit in here for legal fees. God, I hope you don't need it, um, but just stash in some way. Uh, maybe some consulting and I would, I would differentiate. Uh, consulting would be like paying somebody to do stuff for you versus like if you pay for a coach or a coaching program, that would be more like education and events or something. They're not doing anything for you. Maybe they're lending you some expertise, but they're not actually like working on your business with you. They're just helping coach you. Um, I won't put them here. This would be like if you're paying somebody to actually do things for you. Um, a little bit for bank charges, some, some office supplies and expenses, computers, printers, paper pens, whatever. Um, I think you can beat 1%, but I wanted this to be 15. And so I had to make these numbers work for the total bucket to be 15. You know what I mean? Um, and a little bit extra for other general and admin. Um, so 15 is like, if, is, if you're paying yourself a wage and you're paying people in the office a wage, like it's fully scaled. It's not if you're just taking distributions, but you're working in the field, your admin should be lower because you're probably doing sales calls and answering the phone and running payroll. But if you're not taking a wage, 
this should be a heck of a lot lower because this is where your wage would be. Your, your distributions, if you will, um, assuming you're not running it through payroll, are gonna be on the balance sheet. You're gonna be distributing equity. You're not paying payroll taxes. You're not paying yourself a wage. So make sure this bucket isn't at 15% unless you are actually taking a wage and you're in here. Um, then you got a spot for the actuals. So two other buckets and then I'm watching my clock because I got a call to jump on here in a sec. Just had to squeeze this video in. You know how we do it when we're entrepreneurs. Um, so fixed overhead costs are those costs that you proactively contract and are generally the same every month or, or close to the same and you're paying paying for the same thing over and over and over again and you kind of decide once and then you live with it until you're like oh that thing sucks or it's too expensive or i need to renegotiate it and then you work on that um the other bucket and i'll circle back to fix to talk about what's in there the other bucket would be variable where it's more reactive overhead expenses things that come up either opportunities challenges problems and you just kind of got to solve them with money um so variable reactive fixed proactive Fixed costs generally are a measure of your negotiating skills, your contracting skills, or your proactivity. I, mean, I keep saying proactive, I guess. Um, but it's things like your insurance, your liability, your auto insurance, your rent expense, your lease expense for uh, the space that you're using. Um, software expenses would fall in there. Like you get a CRM. I love Service Monster. We're on Service Monster in our Minneapolis-based business. Works super well. We pay the same thing every single month. And I don't plan on switching it because it'd be a total pain in the butt, right? Um, we use Ring Central for our phone system. That falls into software for us. Um, just because it's kind of a software type of phone, right? It's, it's like we can, you know what I mean? Um, versus utilities, phone, internet. Like if you have an office hardline phone, I'd put that in utilities, phone, internet. Any other utility bills, internet bills, waste bills, whatever, where it's like just a monthly bill that you're not going to necessarily get rid of. It's a fixed cost. You're just stuck with it should be around 5% total in this bucket. Variable overhead, like I said, are things that come up or problems that happen and you pay money to make it go away. So things like education, and let me caveat this bucket really quick. You can see I've got like a lot of piddly dollar amounts in here. I'm not as concerned about where you spend the money within this bucket. This is just kind of like a general outlay of like, here's how it might happen and how you might budget for this. Um, the bigger thing is that you don't go over 5% in this budget, in this bucket. You might spend less here and spend a little bit more there, but really managing to that 5% in the variable bucket is super important because this is a general measure of your frugality. If you're over 5%, it tends to mean you're just kind of winging it and throwing money at problems. So if you find yourself over 5% in this bucket, it's a good lesson to be like, I'm spending too much. I got to find some money to save. This is a great bucket to, when something comes up, be like, nope, not spending it. Uh, it's hard to do that with fixed costs. You can't just be like, rent bill's coming up. Nope, I'm not paying it, right? Like, that's a tough one, but variable costs are a good place for you to save that money. So I've got stuff for education, events, leadership development. If you're going to conferences, if you're in a coaching program, stuff like that could fall into here. Um, you've got employee engagement. Yeah, you should be spending money on employees to do cool things because they like it but you got to budget for it. You got to have some money set aside for it. Maybe a holiday party, maybe a summer party, whatever it is that you do, but put some money set aside to do cool stuff with your employees. You sure as hell better be spending a decent amount of money on recruiting because in the service industry, literally our people are our product. So I, I put a lot of money in that budget. Um, I want the best players on my team and I'm going to make sure we spend enough money to get them. Um, we've got a little bit in for repairs and maintenance for auto tools, stuff like that. Um, we've got stuff for shop supplies. We've got stuff for travel meals and entertainment stuff in here. Um, so there's a lot. <laughs> One thing I realized I don't have anything for, for auto repairs and maintenance. So I totally need to put something in there. I'm going to borrow it from recruiting. I think I was just dabbling with this before, but obviously we're going to have auto repairs and maintenance. What are you crazy? Um, so anyway, we'll make a tweak there, but, um, you definitely need to have some auto repairs and maintenance. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna have some. I know it. So, in pest control, we add this stuff all up. We should be at around 20% profit margin. Now, that's not taxable necessarily because you may have some depreciation from this assets and liabilities tab. Go watch that video. Um, but there's two last little things on this main tab that I want to show you. 
to kind of like shortcut you to it. One would be putting in your budgeted depreciation uh, or and or amortization expense, which is gonna reduce that uh, net profit that you had there uh, for tax purposes. So make sure you get depreciation amounts from your CPA for any assets that you bought this year to help you understand what your budgeted net income for tax purposes is gonna be. And then also there's a section down here for uh, understanding your cash flows. You're gonna have expenditures money leaving the door and maybe money coming in but generally money leaving the door that isn't going to be on your p l it's not going to be up in that net income the big ones are going to be distributions if you're taking money out not through payroll put that in as a negative number here it's money coming out um you might also be putting some money back in and reinvesting your own money into the business that would go under owner contributions there's cash outflows from down payments and loan principal payments. So when you're paying off an asset, whether it's the down payment or the monthly payment principal portion, that's not hitting your P&L. It sure as hell still leaving your bank account, but it is not an expense. Only the interest portion of the payment is an expense that reduces your tax liability. This is just you paying a loan back. It's not an expense. It doesn't reduce your tax liability. But again, it sure as hell goes out of your bank account. Um, and for cash flow purposes, it's good to know that stuff. Um, you may also have cash inflows like when you borrow the money for the loan that you eventually need to pay back. Um, so capture those in here and again, put your actuals in here. This is all stuff you can do on the assets and liabilities tab and it'll feed in here. Um, but make sure that you're understanding those cash flows from a business perspective. And I think that's it guys. That is the pest control budget. So go download the pest control budget if you haven't done so already. Um, hit me up with any questions on the template. I'll, as always, let us know if you need bookkeeping help and you need somebody to make sure all this stuff is being tracked for you, go into the right buckets. That's what we do for a bunch of people. I think we have over hundred clients in the home service industry now, best control included in that. So let us know if you need some help, enjoy your free target budget and uh, go check out the bookkeeping beer and BS Facebook page. If you haven't done so already, cause I'm giving away free stuff out there all the time, free content. Uh, every week. So go check it out. Um, nerd out on business stuff. Have some fun with the beer while we do it. And I'll catch you guys on the next video. Oh, I got to switch stuff around on my screen here so I can stop the recording. All right. Stop record. Stop share. I'll see you guys on the next one. Go check out the videos for the different tabs and stuff. That's how I'm going to close it out. <laughs>